schedule after that. I will. I do have a call after that, so I can give oh. like let's say four or five minutes more if people have oh. questions. Um, and I can take questions as we present, uh, no problem. So feel free to stop me. It's more conversational than me lecturing. Okay, so. sure. So, uh, darling, are you recording? Or yeah, I think. Go ahead, Saeed. Okay, good. So, okay, today we are glad to have Dr. Shikhar Pandey. Uh, he was our alumni, so uh, we are glad to have him again at Pullman, but remotely. So, he holds a bachelor degree in electrical engineering from NIT, Panta, India, and master and PhD degree in electrical engineering from Washington State University in Pullman. He is pursuing an MBA from Chicago Booth School of Business. Currently, he serves as a senior manager of DER planning and engineering at Commonwealth Edison, which is ComEd. Com he is the chair of the IEEE Distribution Resiliency Task Force, co-chair of the IEEE Grid Flexibility Tax Task Force, and technology lead for the IEEE Industry and Technical Support Leadership Committee. So with that, floor is yours. Shikha. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You guys can see my screen fine. Here yeah. be fine, right? Yeah. yeah. All sure. right. So let's let's start. Um, I'm gonna set some background. Um, why am I talking about this work, right? So basically, uh, Professor mentioned that I am chair of IEEE Distribution Resiliency Task Force. Uh, I'm guessing a lot of you guys have heard about SAD, KD, some of the distribution. Uh, reliability metrics, right? Um, that is more for measuring your distribution systems performance. It was set up almost 20, 25 years ago, if, if I had to guess, right? Um, but now the, the voice is growing that those metrics don't serve well uh, in wake of a storm, right? Um, so basically that's where this IEEE wanted to set up a task force under the Standards Association where we would come up with some sort of a guide and eventually it can become a standard. IEEE usually would issue a guide in this case because you know people would want to measure things differently. Uh, the way when I was a student, I didn't understand this as much as I understand it now. The way it works is that every state has a regulator, right? Um, and they have some utilities under them and they set some performance metrics basically, right? So let's say, my regulator in in Illinois could say that uh, when a storm happens, right? Let's say it happens 20 times a year. I want uh, Comet to maintain certain performance, right? That your customer should not be out more than these many hours. They you should not lose uh, X amount of customers uh, in a particular storm or whatnot, right? So things like that can happen, um, but there is no standard way of doing it, right? And I think that's uh, where uh, we come in. IEEE comes in. To, uh, to work with all the utilities across some regulators, national lab, universities, um, uh, you name it, right? And not only in North America, but also I think Australia is involved, um, Europe is involved in this task force, and, and they're trying to figure out a good way to measure resiliency. <clears throat> so this will be a guide. It's about 150 pages. It will go under balloting and review at IEEE starting January. But the way it's structured is that we will talk about you know, reliability and resiliency differences. We'll do some literature review. Uh, even in my PhD, I was working on, on resiliency metric. Um, and we'll talk about some of the resilience goal. What does it mean by resiliency for you? Right? When I say you, I mean a utility uh, and what are the objectives basically. And then we also will discuss a little bit about you know, how do we do modeling, simulation and analysis. This is a growing research field system modeling, simulation, and analysis. Um, a lot of national labs are working on this. A lot of utilities are working on this now, where we track what are threats to a different geography, right? A lot of people are trying to model fire hazards, basically, and which infrastructure is more vulnerable. How do you reduce the vulnerability of that infrastructure? And finally, the meat of the topic is resiliency metric, that how do you actually measure um, your performance when it comes to a storm, uh, when it comes to your investments, right? Um, and then there is also a, a chapter on resilience improvement that talks about, you know, what are infrastructure improvements that we can make? What are operational investments that we can make? What are some of the technological solutions that we can deploy 
to improve those resiliency metrics. And finally, there's case study where, which is where, um, you know, there are like five to six utilities that are taking the resiliency metric that we are proposing in the guide, and they are trying to apply it um, on their system, basically. So with that said, this is how the chapters are, and there are different leads. So, you know, Masood is with PG&E, so they bring a lot of perspective about the, their utility in California. They bring a lot of perspective about fires and whatnot. John Lalata works as an as a consultant. I lead chapter three, which is quantification of resiliency. Uh, then there is EPRI, Quanta, and Burns and Mac leading the next three chapters. Basically, um, there is there's a link to the um, to the basically the guide. You can go and look at it um, now. Before we go into the metrics, we need a definition, right? Because there will be certain things in scope and certain things out of scope, right? Um, there is a FERC definition. I think at this point, a lot of people have defined resiliency their own way. I even my in my thesis would have defined resiliency my own way. But uh, the, the point is that we needed a definition for the people of the task force to kind of follow and develop metrics around it. And our definition is basically capability of electric power distribution system. We're not talking about transmission. We're not talking about generation. It's about distribution system to deliver electric energy to end use customers by avoiding interruptions and or recovering this capability following exposure to naturally occurring high impact, low frequency events. Now, um, what's in, in scope is extreme weather events, natural phenomenon. What's out of scope is bulk energy system, cyber physical security, you know, some of the operational invest uh, events where operator made an error or whatever, right? Um, there is a pushback on this definition where people are saying that they now don't like the term high impact, low frequency events, because the logic is that the frequency is not low anymore. It's happening way too often to call it low. Uh, it's always debatable. So that's something that we will we will talk in our upcoming meeting. Um, but when you think about STAR, right, and you think about distribution infrastructure, what are the things that we can do? One is a storm is coming. Make sure your grid is so strong that you don't lose any customer, right? Which probably will never happen. You will you will lose some customers. So if you do do lose some customers, make sure you restore them as fast as possible, right? So I think these are the two things that can be done. So we are trying to keep it very simple. Um, one thing to think about when it comes to something like this is that uh, the metrics designed should be simple and intuitive so that it doesn't require somebody with a PhD degree to understand it, right? It should be very simple that even if you explain it to a layman, your next door neighbor, they understand it, right? That's the beauty of the reliability metric, right? The CAD, the KD and whatnot, it's, it's simple math. But even though if it's a simple math, it should be logical, it should be intuitive, and it should cover all aspects of what we are talking about, basically. So with that said, this is how the metric is designed, right? So you see resiliency metric, uh, it's designed into two, two parts, system, per let me see if I can get a pointer. Okay, it's designed in two parts, which is system performance and operational performance, right? System performance means loosely is uh, what's the ability of your grid distribution grid to kind of uh, withhold the storm basically okay um, how many what are your threat that you are seeing on your grid right statistically how have you been performing against those threat for example and let's say you did put some investment you figured out your stress points and you made some investments now how does it compare with your past Right, so that's your system performance. When it comes to operational performance, we are talking about automation performance. You can think of this as that now you have a bunch of smaller microgrids that can isolate itself from the grid. Now, as you are building these microgrids, you want to measure how it's helping you in your storm, right? So you can think of that as auto automation performance. Then there is restoration effectiveness. It talks about your customer experience, right? How um, how soon are you restoring people? Um, what is their experience during any storm? And I'll talk about all these metrics uh, very soon. And the last one is emergency storm response, which is basically 
um, you know, how your restoration was carried out in comparison to how many resources did you use, right? Because a restoration also requires resources. So two people can do the same job in, let's say, five hours and 10 people can do that in one hour, right? So that's something that we'll have to figure out uh, as well. So this basically tries to give you everything from before the storm, right? Even before a storm is going to hit you, how do you assess your system all the way till the last customer is restored, right? It tells you a story, all these six metrics tied together. If a utility tries these metrics out and, you know, religiously tries to follow this for a year or two, they will be able to figure out the stress points in their system. They will be able to figure out where they are lagging. They will be able to figure out where they should be putting investment and what kind of investments basically. So that is the thought process. Uh, feel free to stop me and ask any questions that you might, you guys may have as I, as I present. Uh, these darker color uh, boxes are some things that have been somehow used by you know utilities or has been inspired by a metric that was already being used by some utility right for example restoration effectiveness and statistical benchmark is something that comet has developed um, four or five years ago right uh, we have changed it we have tweaked it so that it fits one and all uh, but the original philosophy originated from applying it at, at comet right same thing with assess risk assessment and comparative metric uh, there are utilities that have applied uh, this kind of metric, basically. Okay. So with that said, let's dive into our metrics. So the first one is asset risk assessment. So what is happening these days is uh, a lot of regulators. Remember, I talked about regulators early on. Uh, they are asking the local utilities to conduct a climate change studies, right? Some of you might be using in your research. Um, but every utility is kind of being asked to do a climate vulnerability study is what they call it. What it means is that, let's say, in California, right? What are some of your threat landscapes? So in the Northern California, they will talk about, you know, threat to wildfires, right? And you know, wildfire is happening. It's also happening in, in Washington now, in Idaho. Um, so you're aware of this. And it never used to happen, what, 10 years ago, 15 years ago? Right, at least not when I came to Pullman, which was 2015. Uh, but now I'm hearing a lot of these wildfire incidents and happening like every year now. So that's now one uh, threat that that they face. The other one that they face is that because of climate change, the temperature of of the whole world will rise. Right, let's say by two degrees, that could lead to rise in uh, the sea level. That could lead to a flooding-like situation. So every city that had a substation at ground level now needs to elevate their substation, right? So this requires a lot of money to do, right? Um, and that is why you know these studies are being done to kind of focus on what is your threat and making sure that you are resolving by the right investment against those threats, right? So the first one is just a simple um, you know understanding that if you're Threat is that temperature, heat, and humidity is rising. What you have to do is you have to derate your equipment, right? What it means is that let's say a transformer could carry 500 amperes of current, right? Uh, that was based on a factor of your ambient temperature. But now, did if your ambient temperature rose, the transformer is more prone to failure. So you may want to not operate it at 500 amperes. You may want to op operate it at let's say 450 amperes, right? Same thing with uh, if your wind and ice is a threat of your system, you may want to make sure that your lines and everything else is a little bit farther from vegetation, right? As you can imagine, if there is a tree right next to your lines and high wind, the tree might touch the line, right? More often than not. So this is just an intuitive way to do that. But once we are done with this, the real thing is that you map it against your equipments, right? So now you have figured out that, hey, my utility has high risk to wind and ice and it has a you know low risk to let's say wildfire for example right let's say if i am in this box so if i am in high risk to wind and ice i need to worry about my overhead equipments maybe i should underground them right if i'm getting a lot of tornadoes or hurricanes right whatever happened in the carolinas um, and if i am at low risk at wildfire i should not care about you know the substation right and even if i had a wildfire threat 
the substation is not at a high risk, right? What would be at high risk is overhead equipment, basically. So I can map this out. Eventually, I think in the later versions of this guide, the science is not there yet, but in a later version of these guides, guides we would want to see a number here, a standardized number that I can say, hey, wind and ice overhead equipment is at nine. And that number should mean something to me uh, sitting here at, in Chicago. That should mean something, somebody in New York, right? And it should mean the same thing to everybody. Uh, but it's not standardized yet. We are not there yet. Uh, we, we wish to be there. But for now, this is the first metric uh, that we are proposing. The second metric is statistical benchmark. This is something that we've been using for four or five years now. And it's, it's what it means is that if you plotted your temperature against your outage, right, there would be a low threshold of temperature where you will start to see a lot many outages and there will be a high threshold of temperature where you will start to see that many outages, right? And this is a five year data. We take that and we figure out what is the mean, what is the standard deviation, what is the performance when something like that occurs, right? So you have your temperature, you have your wind, you have your lightning, you have different, all the different weather threats, right? You take those threats and then you make a statement based on statistical analysis, right? That in the last five years, when the temperature was between eight, 85 and uh, 80 and 85 degrees, I used to lose 10,000 customers on an average. Let's say that's your statement, that's your benchmark, right? Now you work on improving that, right? You figure out where your stress points are, why it used to happen, you make some investments. Now, a year or two years later, you make a different statement. That now, when I hit 80 and 85 degrees of temperature, I don't lose 10,000 customers on an average, I lose 9,000 customers on an average. And that delta is the improvement, right? That's how you're able to measure where you started from and where you're going. And you can do this for temperature and all the identified threats, all the weather parameters, right? Again, this is a guide. When we put this out there, we are trying not to be very rigid in terms of, okay, you need to measure for these, 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 these things. Because for somebody whose system is underground, they may not even care about wind speed because they don't lose anything even if the wind speed is high. Everything is underground, mm -hmm. right? So it really depends what's applicable to which utility. And this is not an exhaustive list. We can put the slip, we can add humidity to this, or we can add any other factors to this. But this is just trying to pro provide a consistent way for utilities and regulators and stakeholders to get on the same page and understand the same thing. Okay. So this is our metric number two. Now, uh, the met before I go into the metric number three, now we will be getting into a storm specific metric. So up till now, the two metrics that I talked about was more about your system. How well is your system doing on an average? Now we will get more into the storms, right? But before we go there, the first statement I want to make is we should always compare apples to apples. What I mean by that is that when ice storm happens, depending upon the size of the ice storm, when I, what I mean by size of the ice storm is that how big of a territory it's hitting. So Comet is 11,500 square miles of territory. If an ice storm so large is hitting Comet, all my resources are distributed, right? But if it's hitting a smaller territory, let's say 2,000 square mile territory, then I have similar amount of resources, but I can focus in a smaller uh, geographical area, right? So intuitively, I should be restoring my customer faster if it's a smaller star versus if it's a bigger star, right? So it's really important to compare apples to apples. So we we try to make that uh, distinction up front that figure out your storm type, figure out, out your small uh, storm size, and then that gives you a storm classification. This is not an exhaustive list of storm. People can say, hey, fire is missing in here or something else is missing in here, right? We just leave it out on the utilities to figure out what they're studying. But this comparison is really important. This, this baselining is really important. So with that said, this metric, the way it would work is, first of all, we are proposing to have a, a sort of a dashboard, basically, right, for every utility to have. And eventually, it should be standardized, uh, but not everything will be applicable to every other utility. So it's a laundry list of things where you start from, you know, storm strength comparison, right? You talk about, let's say this was my, you know, hurricane type medium storm, 70 miles per hour, right? 
where I would get two inches of, of precipitation or rain, right? Now a new event happened. It's in the ballpark. It's it's 80 miles per hour. It's three inches. So these two are comparable. Now if these two are comparable, now I go and figure out, okay, what was the flood situation? And this is all by made up numbers, basically, right? This is not for any utility. I just made it up um, to explain the concept. Then you go and figure out, okay, square miles impacted divided by customer density, right? So it's 50, uh, you know, square miles was uh, was impacted and customer density was uh, 1,000 customers per square mile, basically, right? So this is something, and in this case, it was 1,200. So you go from here and then you figure out, okay, how many, uh, you know, pole, poles were lost? What was the performance of your automation system? How how did you perform? Uh, did your restoration, basically, how many did you restore in first 24 hours, first 72 hours, and whatnot? Okay, so, and this list can go on and on depending upon what is important and what is a critical contributing factor to this whole resiliency calculation or resiliency narrative. Uh, but once we do compare these things, we will figure out in certain cases we are doing good, you will see improved resiliency, and some places you will see slight delay or minor delay or something right of that sort, right? That tells you how did you perform compared to your benchmark, right? There is a mathematical way of measuring this. Is basically we try to calculate our historical pole damage. So let's say we had 200 poles in our territory, right? Historically, 20 of them are damaged. This ratio of what is remaining divided by total poles will give you 0.8. OK, now the next time and this is your base baseline. Next time you lost 25% of the poles, right? This number will be 0.75. You take a ratio of 0.75 divided by 0.8, you get 0.94, which is basically less than one. That means this was a not a good performance as compared to your base, uh, benchmark. Whereas the second one where we only lost 5% was a, a ratio greater than one. Right, so this is a better performance compared to your benchmark. So everything that I showed you on the last table, yes, it was a dashboard. It, yes, it was uh, something that we want to record, but all of them can be turned out into an equation and, and a metric, basically, depending upon what's important. The reason why we want to do this is we don't want these metrics to be very, you know, what's one number and that decides everything because it will not. Right, my poll loss can be higher, but that can be a function of my wind speed being higher, right? So both of them are higher. So this has to be a very objective analysis. It cannot be a very, you know, one number is telling all the story kind of analysis. OK. So. With that said, um, I'll now move on to the next section, which is basically the operational performance. Right. So up till this point, we discussed, you know, the system performance, basically, how many people are you losing and whatnot. Comparative metric does have elements of that list out some of the operational performance in terms of restoration. It's just to list them out. Um, but at the end of the day, you will uh, talk about your system strength, right? Your performance of automation, your performance of uh, how many poles did you lose and whatnot, right? But then the next part we'll talk about the operational performance of okay the storm came it hit you you lost all the customers that you were about to lose what happens next right and how good that happens basically so when we talk about that the first one is automation hardening performance right uh, i'm still trying to figure out good names for these metrics so after you guys get these slides and you have really good names send it to me okay these names are really not as as good uh, sounding as the reliability metric, right? Um, so I haven't worked on that just yet. But what it means mm -hmm. is that um, let's say in the numerator you have your avoided customer interruption by automation or hardening, right? Now I'll take an example of let's say I had ten customers in my service territory. Okay. Every time a storm hit me, I used to lose all the ten customers, right? So the numerator would be zero because I would never avoid any customers. I lost everything or everybody that I had, right? The denominator will be sustained customer interruption, which will be 10. Sustained meaning that they were actually out, right, in this case. So this ratio is always zero, 
that's where I started. Now assume that I put two customers on a battery run microgrid. I undergrounded one of my customers, right? Um, so that they are not lost. And two other customers, I transferred them to another feeder that was not in the path of the star, right? So now I'm avoiding five customers, right? So this number numerator will be two plus one plus two. And the denominator will be two plus one plus two plus the five I that I actually lost, right? So now this performance is suddenly 0 0.5, right? So now we are able to measure our performance of how the improvement is happening. And this is something that we use at Comet because we have a lot of automation. We have a lot of distribution automation devices where we can transfer some of the customers within the first five minutes of their outage. If we transfer them successfully, we count that as avoided customer interruption, basically. Right. Somebody can define it differently. A utility can go and say, hey, there is some manual work that we have to do, but we can manually transfer somebody from one feeder to another feeder in the first 30 minutes. Right. And that we want to count it as avoided interruption. Right. So that is something that they have to work with their regulator. Eventually, I'm thinking this will all be standardized. Everybody will share their best practices in the working group um, and people will do things similarly basically. But to begin with, there is some sort of room given where um, we can figure out how these things should actually be applied. OK. So that's that's the automation and hardening performance. The second one is restoration effectiveness. Now this talks about customer experience. So right now when we lose power. In, in Comet, you will open up your app, right? So we have an app. For, for our utility, I'm pretty sure Avista might have one too, um, where I can see what is my estimated time of restoration, right? So we have an algorithm that runs that will figure out depending upon where you are, how many crews we have, we will try to tell you what's your estimated time of restoration, right? Um, so that's the customer experience that, that you get, right? Now, this metric is designed to achieve something like that. What it does is the denominator is exactly the same, it's just flipped. But it's exactly the same, which was here, right? Uh, I think I, I, I should actually flip it there as well, so it's not confusing. Uh, but denominator is exactly the same in the numerator. Now we are talking about customer without power for more than Z hours. Z is defined by the utility. For Comet, we have that number as 12. And reason for having it 12 is it take it usually takes us about four hours because our territory is so big. It takes us four hours for a storm to pass through our territory before we can actually start working in full force, right? So we still want to give ourselves eight hours of working time to actually measure a meaningful performance, right? Two hours, three hours might not be as meaningful because it does take quite a lot to restore people, right? So we want to give ourselves um, eight hours of working time. So for us, this number would be 12. If a utility is smaller, uh, they may consider 10 hours, two hours for the storm to pass through and eight hours to work, right? If they're even more smaller, they can give five hours, right? One hour to pass through and four hours of working time because they get good performance in, in that time, depends. But the point is, now let's go back to the example of 10 customers. When we had 10 customers and we had zero automation and hardening, we used to lose all the 10 customers, right? This numerator, will be now a function of all those 10 customer because this numerator is always a function of sustained customer interruption, right? You will restore people who you have lost, right? So now in the scenario that I described where we were able to avoid five customers, this numerator will be function of five now, right? So let's say as a utility, you make a statement and your statement is that in first 12 hours, I restore 70% of my customers that are out. Let's say that's a statement, okay? This metric would, so you restore 70%, that means the customer without power will be 30%. So this will be 3 divided by 10 that you lost in the first case, right? Yeah, the slides will be shared. Um, in the second cases, uh, case where you have sustained customer interruption as 5, now with the same statement that you restore 70%, this number will be 1.5, right? So now your overall metric from 0.3 it came down to 0.15, right? As a result of 
just increasing automation. So your customer experience improved. Now, if you compare, if you pair this with that earlier, I used to store 70% customers in the first 12 hours. Now I made some changes. Now I'm restoring 90% of them. This will have further improvement. So we can see substantial improvement in customer experience when it comes to something like restoration. One part that this metric is missing is that it doesn't talk about uh, the amount of resources that we use, right? Um, because if I asked you a question and I said, hey, uh, you are out, you have lost power, I can use 10 resources, 10 crews to restore you in one hour, okay? I can use 20 resources to restore you in 40 minutes, and I can use eight resources to restore you in one hour, 10 minutes. Which one do you want? If you are concerned about fastest restoration, you will choose 40 minutes. You'll say, hey, restore me in 40 minutes, right? But the problem is that to restore you in 40 minutes, now I'm using double the amount of resources, right? So that will come on your bill. You will be paying for that, um, that recovery, right? So that might not be the most right answer, basically. Right. But what is the right answer? I don't know. Right. And that is where we have to figure out a metric that will take us to that right answer. Okay. Which this metric doesn't do, but the next one tries to do, do that. Right. So I'm, I'm sure a lot of you would have seen this resilience trapezoid. It's a very famous, highly cited research paper where people talk about, you know, pre event state then a disturbance happens, you start losing your customer, you stay in the degraded state, and then you start your restoration, and then you come to a post restoration state, right? So you started with a, let's say 100 customer, you drop down to 30 customers, you came back to 100 customer. This is the um, restoration curve. If you make some improvements, the curve should shorten, you should not lose as many customer, and you should restore faster than you normally would, right? That was the philosophy. How does that look in a real utility data is this graph basically, right? This red curve that you're seeing is customer out every hour accumulated, right? So eventually um, we come about 110,000 customers out, for example, in this particular example. The green graph that you see is amount of customers restored that's also accumulated. Eventually this green graph will touch the red graph and that's where star window is over. Right, everybody that was out has been restored. The difference between these two curve is the area under the curve, which is this blue curve, which is exactly this in, inverted trapezoid that you see. Right, it just doesn't look that real in real life. Right, it's a really poor looking trapezoid. Right, um, which kind of sucks, but that's that's the reality. Um, now, if I were to ask, what is the best resilient performance? What would you ideally want, right? The answer would be that, hey, make sure that this area under the curve is zero, meaning that this green graph is always touching this red graph, meaning that as soon as a customer is out, you restore them in like two minutes, right? That will require infinite amount of resources to do so, first of all, right? So that might be not be the best thing to do. Now, what is the best thing to do? So let's look at this this graph right red looking graph this is amount of resources used every hour right so it's let's say it's crew hour so you, you sum of all of it it will tell you how many crews did you use in this particular star right so it's very good to see that at the start of the storm you will have a certain staffing level at night you reduce people don't work as much as night next day you know you staff up more you bring in more crews and as soon as you're getting you know, your system restored, you reduce your number of crews and, you know, slowly you re recover everybody, right? That is basically how typically it works. Sometimes what happens is that you are caught off guard, meaning your own crews are assisting somebody else. So right now, Comet's crew, some of Comet crew is helping in North Carolina, right? They have a really bad outage. We are working there and there is no weather forecast, a bad weather forecast uh, to hit us. But let's say if it came out of nowhere, we would have a problem, right? And that's just the reality of things, right? Um, I hope that doesn't happen. Most of the time it does not happen, 
But if that happens, sometimes we are in a crunch that we can't get enough resources. So in that scenario, this whole, <coughs> this whole graph can look you know, even more longer and your area under the curve can be even more, um, a lot more basically. So going back to the point of, you know, 10 crews, one hour, 20 crews, 40 minutes, eight crews, um, you know, one hour, 10 minutes, which one is the right answer? How do we figure out that right answer? So for that, there is this equation, right? Which is log of area under the performance curve that we talked about divided by customer interruption, right? Area under the performance curve is a function of customer interruption, right? If I go back, this area, is a function of how many people do you lose? If you lost less number of people, which is shown in this graph, you can see the area of this graph, right? Which is by RPDO is less than this area of RPDI, right? So that's intuitive. The crew hours um, is the total amount of crew hour that you use divided by outages. Now, for, for those of you who are not familiar what I mean by customer interruption and outages. In our OMS system, we track outages, right? We track point of failure. That will be one outage that will be associated with five customer, 10 customer, 15 customer, 100 customers, right? Customer can be any, right? There could be one outage in one customer. There could be one outage and thousand customers associated to that, right? What I mean by that is let's say you have a long line feeder. If you a tree hits at the head end of the feeder, you lose everybody on that feeder. It's all the customers are associated to that one outage. If the tree hits at the end of the line, right, and you just lost one customer, then that's one outage and one customer. So crews restore outages. Outages then in turn restores the customer, right? So remember what we were talking about earlier, that we want ideal performance is that this area under the performance curve should be as low as possible. And this crew hour should also be as low as possible. The only problem is the brute force way to achieve low area under the curve would be to increase the screw hour, right? But we know that we will hit a optimal point, we'll hit a minima, after which even if you're increasing more crews, you can't do much, right? Let's say there is a pole and you're trying to screw the pole, put the screws in the pole, and it's a two man job, even if you put 10 people there, there's not enough space to work. It's still a two man job, right? So we should not be mistaken by the fact that we can pump up the crew and area under the performance curve would reduce. For some time, it may reduce, right? But it won't be true for all scenario. You will still have uh, a negative or no impact on area under the performance curve, even negative impact if you clog everybody in the same place. So this equation does a really good job to give you the optimal point, right? Now look at the example. In the first example, we have 96,000 customers out. Area under the performance curve is about 2.7 million, 1,500 outages, and 227,000 customer out. When you plug these numbers in this equation and take the log of it, you get 3.63, right? This number is lowest in this whole list, okay? Um, the highest number is something like this which is your 4,000 customer out, about 4 million area under the performance curve, right? 195 outages and 65,000 crew hours, okay? This is 5.5. Now, if, and this is something definitely went wrong in here because the outage is 20 times less, crew is only, you know, eight times less, right? So you can see it's not working out, right? Um, now, this is not a very ideal performance. What we want to do is we don't want to penalize somebody for a one off event. Things can happen, right? For example, in North Carolina, things are happening. They didn't expect it to be that big. Um, that you want to analyze that storm and compare that storm with that storm classification. So it's, let's say category four hurricane comparison with category four hurricane, depending upon how much territory it hit you, right? So that's something that we want to be mindful of. Um, but let's assume that all of these are same category storm, same types of storm, right? We take the average of this and we say, hey, our average is between 4 and 4.5. If you took the average of this, it's between, this 5.5 number is skewing, skewing things off, but the average is between 4 and 4.5. So the utility will say that my yearly average should lie between this dead band, 
4 and 4.5. As long as that's happening, that means that I'm using my resources optimally and I'm able to restore my customers fine. But over the years, you may want to shift this towards the left. Like next year, you may want to show a performance of 3.8 to 4.2, right? Or 4.3. Uh, you, now you have shifted it backwards and you will hit a point where you will hit optimality for your system, which is basically, you know, let's say 2 to 2.5 is your optimal point. You cannot improve further more than that, but now your customers know what to expect. They know on an average for a, your threat uh, that you face, how much bill are they going to pay uh, for restoration and recovery? OK, so this kind of completes our six sets of metric. It started by assessing the threats on your system, your statistics of how your system performs against those threats, your comparison of one storm against the other, your performance of your automation system, microgrids and whatnot, your customer experience of restoration timing, it's a timing factor, and finally, your effectiveness of how you ran the storm, right? What did it cost you to get to that experience? Right, which is star resource effectiveness. So that kind of covers the spectrum of what a distribution utility would think and how they would measure and how they would plan um, a system when it comes to a, a weather event, basically. So with that said, as I said, two of the metrics uh, we've been applying since 2020, almost four or five years now. Um, it has really helped us uh, to concentrate in areas that really need improvements. Right. Um, I can look at some of these metric and I can even without knowing about a star because I've looked at all these so many times, I can tell which area it has hit me. I can tell if it hit me in rural area or suburban area. Right. And how I can improve on that. If you look at these, you apply this on the data, you will develop that intuition um, gradually. Um, there are four ut other utilities that have provided their um, uh, case studies basically trying to apply these metrics so that will be part of the guide uh, and there are three more that we are working one in in Europe um, and two more in the US basically and the first draft as I mentioned earlier will be for review um, and, and ballot uh, in IEEE GTCM it happens in January so that's where the IEEE members will start reviewing it right now the task force members are reviewing and the chapter guides are addressing the comments that that process will go on till January. It's a lengthy 150 page document. Um, the management of it itself is, is bulky, but so far the regulators and stakeholders don't have a metric for resiliency. So we view everything from the lens of reliability metric. IEEE 1366 is the reliability standard. Um, we want to move away from this and the only way to move away from this is to provide an alternative. Right, and we're trying to say that, hey, this is one alternative how you can figure out your resilience days uh, and evaluate them. Okay, I think that's about it. This is just a timeline slide of where we are at in the process uh, when it comes to the guide. Um, but just just to focus on here, the final deadline to get in all the comments and submit it is is January next year. Um, so if if you guys have any comments after this or even right now, please let me know. I'll try to make sure that it's incorporated in some way, shape or form uh, with the guide. OK, any questions, comments, suggestions? Thank you. Thank you. For your great talk, so let's. We first let's start from people online. I see that there is a question on chat box. Let's see. Yeah, I think the question is, will the slide be shared? Uh, oh, okay. I think, yeah, it, it will be shared. I think there is a recording as well. And we can share the slides, no problem. Oh, great. If if people online have any question, please unmute yourself and ask your question. There's another question. Yeah, so one yeah. question is, do you look at equipment vulnerabilities? And if I go to the first metric here, 
this is this is what we are trying to say here right that you have your equipment substation overhead underground and you can list more equipments and you can say which one of them are vulnerable to what kind of threat and before that we have said that your utilities face says what kind of threat so yes uh, we are trying to look at equipment vulnerabilities right now there is not a mathematical way of saying equipment vulnerability is 3 for flooding right that science is not there just yet uh, you guys do some some research at washington state and we can in incorporate that as part of the metric basically um shikhar uh, continuing on to that is it because of lack of data uh in terms of when an event happens would uh how identifying the equipment that exactly had the problem because of the event mm -hmm. is that the reason because i'm from pnnl um uh so we are trying to look at understanding the impacts on equipment due to weather mm -hmm. and we feel like the data is missing but i would like to know what you think about it from the utility standpoint well first of all yes the more data is needed right so hands down i agree with that um a second thing is that if data was available you can benchmark yes you can say that historically this is what has happened so probabilistically if similar thing were to occur, this is what will happen, right? Now think about if if this data is out, people will be making changes to the equipment, the material they use. At the same time, climate change is there, so the weather is changing. So it's kind of a moving target problem. So we will not be able to nail it down to a military precision. But what happens is that equipments you can do two things, right? One is you identify your equipments that are more probable to failure and you can proactively replace them, right? That's one thing that you can do. Um, the question there would be that, did you replace them too soon? Could they have gone longer? Is that a good use of money? Second thing, and which I think is a better thing to do, is to figure out, okay, how many distribution transformers do you have? Based on the data that you were asking about, uh, Kishan, you can figure out that, okay, 5,000 of my distribution transformer or 3,000 of my distribution transformer are vulnerable to failure. You can have, the, have them in stock, right? Because of all the supply chain issues, right? You can have them in stock, and if they do do fail, you replace them quickly, right? That's another way of improving resilience. So uh, there is a trade-off between replacing them too soon and letting them go out. And that is something that will depend upon utilities, philosophy, customer experience, stakeholder experience, um, and you know, basically commissions head where, where it is at when it comes to something like this. So, but to answer your question, yes, data is the first place I would start. Awesome, thank you. Any other question, people on that? Yeah, can you um, I had a data? question. Uh, sorry. Yeah, I can just ask it. Um, yeah, sure. great presentation. So you talked about some of these like customers having to pay for how fast their you know outage is restored. Is there any backlash in that? Like in terms of like, um, you know, why would somebody maybe who has the resources he can he can get the outage fixed faster in their neighborhood versus other neighborhoods? Uh, I think it's less about. In neighborhoods um it's mostly about when when your service territory is so large right and you let's say planned to have or your weather forecast was to have that in one region but by default it hit other region and you had your uh, resources pre-staged in this region there is no way you can restore the other region faster you have to transfer the resources there right um, and the way the restoration happens is that we try to restore people as fast as possible, like with the amount of resources that we have, right? That's a philosophy that you know anybody would use, right? Any utility, I'm pretty sure that's exactly what they're trying to do, uh, to restore as many people as, as fast as possible with you know a little bit focus on critical infrastructure. Some people may have that, 
uh, built in into their philosophy. So I don't think that there will be a backlash because it will always depend. It will always change, right? The one thing I will say is where you will see a difference is let's say New York downtown, right? You don't see overhead wires there. You will see everything underground. So they may not lose power as often as some of the rural area, right? That can happen. And that happens for a reason, you know, in city center, usually things are underground. So they do get a different experience uh, when it comes to threat. In terms of restoration, we will just try to do the most optimal thing that we think is out there. I would question if that decision is the most optimal, right? It's humans making those decisions. It's not made in a very algorithmic fashion, not always. There is some logic to it. Um, but that part I don't know. Now the question is, um, if they have to pay for the restoration speed, right? The speed can be high by better management of your crew by sending them at the right location. That's something that you still pay the same, right? Or you can have a higher speed by just adding more mass to your system, right? If you're adding more mass and they are getting restored faster, your equation will tell you if that was the right thing to do or not. That's why we are trying to design the equation, right? But if you're just adding more mass and you're not getting a better experience, right? Less area under the performance curve, your equation will tell you that too. And that is where, you know, the regulators or the stakeholders can analyze the data and say, hey, this is where the performance is not good. So we have to uh, kind of rectify it or the utility can look at themselves and rectify it. So that's exactly why we are trying to put up the metric so we can actually measure this. Up till now, it's it's not measurable. Yep, thank you. Oh, there's another question. So, Hishan, do you want to ask question yourself or can you yeah. unmute yourself? Yeah, sure. Yes, yeah, sure. Ahead, um, I just have a quick question. So the metrics are talking about things in an average sense, right? I mean, if it is like, if we are quantifying things in real time or after the fact, it would be a deterministic thing, right? However, let's say if we are doing look ahead studies into the future and we are trying to assess the vulnerabilities up to the system, would using the same metrics, but a confidence interval version of the metrics be useful? Uh, Definitely. Uh, yeah, hundred okay. percent. If you're doing look ahead, you have to use confidence interval version of the metric, right? That's why if I go here, I was trying to get to a thing that hey, this is your range basically, right? As long as you are in certain range, you are good because you cannot hit one value. I cannot say that I will hit three point six three every time, right? So I think once you're doing a look ahead scenario, and I think that is where we want to get to once this thing is out there and you are able to say, hey, I am developing this strategy of how to do storm restoration against XYZ threat for this particular utility. And the way I will measure the performance is this metric. You can see in these three scenario, if you did strategy one, strategy two, strategy three, we are getting better at this metric, right? That's the whole point of doing this. After that, it's left to people at PNNL, Washington State to come up with you know, further steps um using this metric and providing those solutions uh, for better resiliency this will not provide you a solution for better resiliency or it will or all it will do is it will tell you if it improved or not yeah thank you okay, no more online people any questions no Okay, so you guys in the room, do you have any Yeah, um, so I, I have one question actually on, on this slide about the uh, ERF calculation. Um, so I, I see the attempts to control for the intensity of the storm with dividing by customer interruptions and outages. But when you talked about area under the performance curve, you specifically talked about this lag time between the increased uh, number of outages and the customers being restored and that lag time being 
partially due to actually deploying your resources, but also partially due to the duration of the storm. So in, in the case where you have an unusually long storm, wouldn't you have a much larger area under the performance curve just because you could not safely deploy your crews yet? It didn't necessarily mean that you're, you did a worse job managing your crews, just that you had to wait longer before deploying them. And that has less to do with your planning and more to do with just that's how the storm was. I, I didn't catch your name. Uh, what, what is it? Jacob. Name? Jacob. That's a really brilliant question, Jacob. Uh, in fact, this is something that we were discussing just two days back. One of the things to watch out when you apply this metric, right? Exactly what you explained. So what Jacob is basically saying is that uh, if a storm still has 50,000 customer out, 250 outages, right? Two storms you had. One got you 50,000 customers out and 250 outages in two hours. The other storm got you in 10 hours. Your area under the performance curve will be larger for the 10 hours, even though the denominator is the same, right? And that's a, a brilliant observation that can totally happen, right? It do, usually doesn't happen, but it can happen, right? In the edge case, you know, this is a possibility, right? It's a mathematical possibility if it's if, even if it's not a practical possibility in some sense, right? But again, two hours to four hours is easily happening. I can see that happening all the time, right? Uh, if that happens, that is where what will happen is that you have to go back to your comparative metric, right? And you have to add a line item there, that duration of storm, meaning how long did it happen, right? That gives you some sort of, you know, uh, subjectivity to when you look at this number, right? Because it's not going to solve world hunger. Right? It's not going to solve all the problems. There will still be some of those edge cases where we have to figure out what's happening, right? Because once we look at our two feeders, one is 100% or 75% underground, the other one is 100% overhead, right? Same, same day, similar area, two streets apart, it will have different performance, right? But there is a reason for that different performance, right? One is underground that is not as prone to failure, the other one is more prone to failure. As long as we can go back to that reasoning, I think it's good, but it's a 100% good observation. It can totally happen for a similar number of denominator. You can see difference in performance, right? The only thing that I would do in that, that case is if the storm is longer, I would go better on my prediction. And then I would not have a thousand crews for the eight hour storm. I would have only, you know, 500 crews, right? Because the storm is slow moving, I will deploy the same crew here. I'll then move them as the storm moves versus keeping a thousand crew in the first case where, you know, everybody's a go. That, that's a lot of wastage. So that's how I would control for it. But I would probably not know that when a prediction comes or I may or may not, right? So as the science improves, as the prediction improves, as the real time awareness of where the crews are improved, you will see a difference. Does it help, Jacob? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. That's okay, the last question because Dr. Pandey has, yeah, you are the last one. Oh, yeah, that's a lucky guy. So, so great presentation. Thank you so much for the presentation. And uh, uh, so, what I understand from this presentation is usually when we are designing the restoration strategies, we are actually not doing an apple to apple comparison. We are trying to look for a generalized solution that would work best for each and every case. And this matrix would help us to assess how that's working in each and every case. Uh, in this case, suppose nine storms are there. Now, my question is that whenever we are dealing with all this, uh, this matrix takes quite a lot of assumptions. That is what you said out of scope. Setting that aside as well, suppose we are just dealing with physical, not the cyber physical system. So when you're restoring the loads, there's certain qualitative criticality uh, that's uh, associated with that. Suppose I say some load is high critical, some is medium, some is low. And if, if I am to do that, I do not see how I can assess my restoration strategy, even though it will, it might perform really bad on this matrix. But when it comes to qualitative effectiveness of the restoration strategy, that would provide a better solution, uh, even okay. though it's not providing uh, the the resources to every customer at the same time. But the qualitative assessment is there so that the society would benefit. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, if I understand your question correctly, you're saying that when you do your restoration, you prioritize, uh, you have this habit of prioritizing critical load, right? How does that, how does this metric capture that, right? Is that the question? So yes. my question would be, if you do prioritize that, no matter what I say, you will still prioritize that, right? For all of these nine storm, that will be baked in. That prioritization is always baked in, right? So yes. your area under the performance curve already will have that blocked, that area blocked for critical load. Now it's about you doing that first, plus what do you do after, right? Yes. So in, in that sense, it does. But to your question, so, I think uh, so, there should be uh, another metric that focuses only on critical load. If that is, uh, which which is very much developed in literature, a lot of people have focused on critical load. Um, basically, you define how much critical load you have, how much you lost, how soon you recovered and whatnot. Here, there is a reason why we are not focusing on critical load is because we don't want to signal that that a household where who has a person who is on life support is non-critical, right? So uh, it's it's a little bit uh, a, a difficult discussion in that sense, right? But when I was doing my PhD, I was defining critical loads as well. That was my definition of resiliency as well. But then if I want to use this matrix to compare two strategies, that's what my question is. So if I use this matrix to compare those two strategies, can I really do the comparison or this matrix is not for that purpose at all? No, it's a, no. I I don't think you can compare the strategy of when you add critical load. It's oh. it will not it will not do that because, you know, what's happening in that scenario in your question is that, you know, you are because of your two strategies, you want credit for a strategy that restores critical load faster, right? Here yeah. you lose that information. Here yeah. that information is lost, right? So yes. if you want to bring that information, you need to develop something similar. Take this metric and now just talk about area in the performance curve for critical load, right? Okay. And that that will that will be your answer basically. Take out all the critical load and all the star. Talk about area in the performance curve for that load, resources used and whatnot, and that that could solve the problem. We are just deliberately trying to stay away from it, uh, the critical load aspect of it. Oh, oh, uh, understand. Thank you. Okay, awesome. thank you very much. Thanks a lot, so guys. So once again, thank you for the seminar. We really appreciate the time you allocated. So this was very informative talk. Thank you. This thank was you. by far the best questions I've received uh, on this, <laughs> other than what Dr. Bose asked me, okay, <laughs> <laughs> which I don't have answers to. Um, great, good, right. great, okay. good. Yeah, that was nice seeing you after a while. So yeah, hopefully Likewise. see you sometime soon. Yeah. Okay. Likewise. Good. Have Thanks a great a day. Good. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye. Bye.